Hello, hello, and welcome to this week's edition of The Logos Project with me, Dom Damaso, theology and philosophy major and content creator. This show aims at taking you back in time to understand prominent thinkers, writers, and cultures. We are semi-educated amateurs here at The Logos Project who constantly strive to deepen our knowledge of the history of human thinking. This is the Logos Project, and this week we're going to take a look at the Philippians hymn and its paradoxical relationship to the apotheosis of Augustus, also known as Octavian. Understanding the backdrop of Roman religion in the first century CE is paramount in understanding the context in which Paul, Paul of Tarsus, writes his letters. In his letter to the Philippians, specifically the hymn that he quotes in chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, the Apostle Paul is establishing both Caesar as a parody of the Messiah and the apocalyptic nature of Christ's death and resurrection. Now, there's a scholarly consensus that the Philippians hymn was not written by Paul, and rather that Paul was actually quoting from a specific hymn that was being used in Christian communities. There's also a few prominent scholars who hold a minority view that Paul actually wrote it. I am undecided, but the more I read it and the more I read Paul, the more I think that that might actually be correct, and this is written by Paul. But that is definitely a minority view. Okay, so part one. Let's look at this. The primitive religion of the Romans in its essential beliefs resembled the religion of the other Indo-European nations. So the Romans worshipped the forces of nature, and they portrayed them as animated beings of different genders whose rivalries were displayed in the clash of the elements, and also whose unions explained the eternal fertility of the world. So this was also the basis for Greek religion. But the Romans bore the imprint of the nations from which their religion was produced. Although they revered their gods, they feared them even more. And the worship which they rendered to them consisted especially of timid supplications and rigorous expiations. Their imaginations lacked resourcefulness and liveliness. In other words, they never really created anything which resembled the rich developments of the poetic legends that we, that we find and that we admire in the Greeks. The pagan religion of Paul's day involved temples, sacrifices, omens, oracles, and a priesthood which overlapped considerably with the local aristocracy. So, priests were not a separate class, but rather politicians or praetors and preconsuls, etc., there was no need for some sort of special knowledge in matters of theology to be a priest. Um, the reason why is because religion at the time was just political. There was no difference between religion and politics. There was a symbiotic relationship, you might say. So there was the traditional pantheon of deities, and the moody unpredictability of the gods is known to most people who have read Homer. Now, this uh, same kind of unpredictability is present in the Roman pantheon. There was also the local or tribal deity peculiar to this city or that region. Roman religion might include particular cults, what we often call mysteries, into which one could be incorporated or, you know, initiated. Thus, that person would gain a religious status in this life and the guarantee of a blissful life after death. Such religion, quote-unquote, both at the public and private level, was unsurprisingly syncretic and gladly accommodated other divinities. As renowned New Testament scholar N.T. Wright explains, groups and individuals migrated around the ancient Near East, resulting in complex crisscrossing varieties of local religions in any one place, in which, for instance, newly arrived gods and goddesses might take the names and attributes of existing local ones. As we saw earlier in this episode, in regard to the relationship between gods and men, Roman religion functioned mostly as a quid pro quo sacrificial system. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. 
When it came to apotheosis, a human being becoming a god, specifically posthumously after death, ancient heroes were worshipped as well as the founders of Roman cities. But living human beings were not. So the question is, where did the arguably unsuccessful attempts to divinize Julius Caesar, this, this took place after he died, and, and especially where did the successful attempts to divinize Augustus during his life originate from? So Professor Henry Fairfield Burton explains that the impulse that led to the deification of the Roman emperors came from the east. The pharaohs and the Ptolemies, Lycurgus and Lysander of Sparta, and Alexander the Great had been worshipped as divinities both while living and after death. When Rome conquered the east, the same divine honors were transferred to the Roman proconsuls. Naturally, when a single ruler of the empire appeared, he was acclaimed as a god in the eastern provinces. Remember, we're talking about a time period in Roman history where there is a drastic change in the government of Rome. It goes from a republic, what's called the Old Republic, to an empire, the new Roman Empire. And at the head of that empire is Octavian, who becomes Augustus. And Augustus is the adopted son of Julius Caesar. So, in the East, worshipping living human beings as gods was not something foreign. However, meanwhile, the way had been prepared for the imperial worship in the minds of the Romans themselves. How? Well, heroes of Roman legends such as Aeneas, Latinus, Romulus, whom the Romans accepted as historical personages and as the founders of the nation, were believed to be of divine descent and were, themselves, honored as deities. So we see this preparation to receive the Eastern apotheotic practice of worshiping human beings as living gods. So it was natural that the founder of the empire, a new and greater Rome, should likewise be regarded as a god and be accorded the same homage. The aftermath of Julius Caesar's assassination is a fascinating story of civil war and betrayal. Suffice it to say that Octavian triumphed and became the first Roman emperor after the fall of the Old Republic, as we said earlier. Octavian labored basically incessantly and ingeniously at the architectural, moral, political, and liturgical reform of the empire. He basically worked during his entire reign at restoring the Roman religion and at restoring the authority it had lost. After Julius Caesar's death and deification, Augustus, being the adopted son of Caesar, received the title of Son of God. So at first, referring to Octavian by the name of Romulus was actually suggested, which allegedly pleased him, I'm sure. <laughs> he was proud to be considered as the second founder of Rome. But... The able-minded Munatius Plancus made a better case for the name of Augustus. Augustus was a name taken from priestly language. It was strongly associated with the ritually consecrated temples. In calling him Augustus, this is something that Florus tells us, it seemed that within his lifetime they wanted to give him a foretaste of the apotheosis that awaited him after he died. Now, Vegetius says something else. He says that once a prince received this name, he would instantly become a sort of present and corporeal god to whom all homage is due. And that is indeed the very idea that Octavian wanted others to have of his power. He was allegedly proclaiming, by taking on this title, that he was invested with a divine authority and that all had to regard him as a representative of the gods on earth. So to conclude this first part, Roman religion was a much more political, much less psychological form of Greek religion and was influenced by the various religious cultures found within the Roman Empire. The posthumous divinization of Julius Caesar led to Augustus's status and title as son of God. 
Eastern apotheotic practices came to the forefront in the empire once Rome had conquered the East. All these factors, combined with the political, architectural, and liturgical reforms of Augustus, led to what is referred to as the imperial cult, that is, the practice of worshipping the Roman emperor as a living god. Okay, so, now for the good stuff. Well, that was actually pretty fun. <laughs> Part 2. In the first century, Augustus was attributed with the title of Soter, which means savior. He was also attributed with the title high priest, in Latin Pontifex Maximus. He was also called Lord, in Greek Kyrios. And finally, as we said earlier, the title Son of God, in Latin Divi Filius. All of these titles are attributed to Christ in the New Testament, which is the exact same time period. In a lecture at Wheaton College, New Testament scholar, again, N.T. Wright, expresses his belief against the current scholarly consensus that Paul actually wrote the hymn found in Philippians 2, specifically verses 6 through 11. This masterpiece of a hymn brings together passages of the Old Testament and the context of the imperial cult. This last point is specifically explicit in verses 10 and 11. Quote, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Kyrios, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So when Paul writes to the church in Rome, where Caesar is actually residing, he begins his letter like this, Jesus Christ was declared to be Son of God, with power according to the Spirit. The title here, Son of God, and the mention of power are undeniably politically charged words. The Philippians hymn explicates the gospel in terms of a clash of kingdoms and, therefore, a clash of kings, Jesus versus Caesar. In the same lecture I talked about, N.T. Wright points out that before the death of Christ, the cross had a religious symbolic meaning that Caesar was Kyrios, Caesar was Lord, and it represented the cost of getting in his way, as N.T. Wright says. The cross went from the symbol of the power of Rome to the symbol of the power of Christ, from symbol of horrible and imperial brutality to symbol of utter divine love. This fits with the messages that we find in the Gospel accounts where the Passion of the Lord is described in enthronement language that echoes the description of the Son of Man in Daniel 7. So in the Passion we see the purple cloak, the crown of thorns, the inscription above the cross, and all these references, references to the lifting up of the Messiah. Now, for Paul, the very nature of power seems to be at the heart of this Philippians hymn. So for Rome, might is right. But for Paul, weakness is strength. He says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. So this vision of power is revealed in Christ's divine kenosis for Paul. What does that mean? So kenosis is a Greek word which means emptying a emptying of self, a descent, a condescension, you might say, a becoming weak. So for Paul, this kenosis is where Christ's power is revealed. This is important. The word revealed here is key. In Greek, apocalypsis means revelation. So Paul alludes to this revelation when he says in Colossians 1.26, quote, this is the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. So the kenosis of Christ is the central theme of the Philippians hymn, and it is an apocalyptic, right, revelatory, exposition of the nature of God's power. However, this can only be fully grasped when it is read in light of the imperial cult of Caesar. So let's actually take a look at the Philippians hymn. So, Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. 
So this echoes both Caesar's power as a man in the form of God who exploits that equality in his rule, according to Paul. It also echoes Adam and Eve's rebellion in Genesis 3, where they want to become like unto God. The next part goes, But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay, so this echoes the description of the suffering servant in the narrative of Isaiah 40-55. through It also hearkens to the curse of Deuteronomy 21-23, where it talks about a man being hung on a tree to die. And, of course, finally, it brings up the Roman symbol of power, the cross. So... The next section goes, Therefore God also highly exalted him. So remember now, the name Augustus means the highly exalted one. So, therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend. Listen carefully here. This is the imperial allegiance that was due to Caesar, whose name Augustus was the name above every name, at which every knee would bend. And so, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Kyrios, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So, in conclusion, understanding the backdrop of Roman religion in the first century AD or CE is paramount in understanding the context in which Paul is writing his letters. So, In the hymn found in chapter 2 of Paul's letter to the Philippians, the apostle is establishing Caesar as a parody of Jesus Christ and explicating the nature of God's power as something unveiled in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God. So this is quite fascinating, historically speaking, because we see the origins from the East and the legends of the Romans of the imperial cult and then we see a interesting kenotic, right, kenosis, an interesting kenotic understanding of power, which stems from the Hebrew scriptures. You see these paradoxical instances in the Old Testament where the Messiah is going to be a suffering servant. Now, a lot of times, uh, several Jewish interpreters didn't understand these, um, didn't understand how they could reconcile these seemingly incompatible passages of a Messiah ruling in power and also suffering and being weak. So this is not to say that, oh, the authors who wrote this down are basically being zapped up into heaven and and just being dictated what to write down and it just came out of nowhere. No, what the authors of these ancient texts wrote, they wrote because of real tangible historical causes. So for the suffering servant, when Isaiah wrote that, he was talking about a character that archetypally represented the nation of Israel. And we know that the nation of Israel was being bullied by the nations and was uh, suffering from its exile. And so there's a, a very good historical, perfectly explainable reason that we have these kind of passages about a suffering servant. Now, on the other hand, you look at other passages of a of a future Israelite king that will conquer all the nations and rule in power, etc. That also has a very explainable historical basis, which is the desire for Israel to be at peace, but also to rule because it's been so maligned and bossed around by Babylon, Egypt, etc. That it wants to be vindicated, right? And you see this in its religious writings. So both of these claims come from very reasonable and historical and understandable origins. But then they're synthesized into a corpus of what becomes the religious writings of this people. And so it's important to understand that after all of this is synthesized, then the Jews of the time read it and they're like, wait a minute, is the Messiah that we are expecting, the one that will deliver us from the oppression of Rome, going to be this great king, conquer the nations, etc.? Or is he going to be someone who just suffers on our behalf and is weak? 
And so, historically speaking, it's a interesting question. And many readers thought, well, there must be two messiahs: one who will conquer Rome, and and one who will bear the curses that we deserve because we have broken the covenant with God throughout our nation's history. Anyway, and what happens in Jesus is that he dies, and supposedly comes back to life and establishes a new kingdom. And Paul here is saying that no, there isn't two messiahs, or we're not still waiting for one, two, or or more, whatever. What Paul is saying is that in Jesus, all these different strands of Israel's religious aspirations have met and have become flesh, you might say. And so for Paul, the way you make sense of this is that in the weakness of Christ's death is the victory over not just Rome, but even what he calls the powers and the principalities. Now, what are those? Well, for Paul, those are the the forces behind the evil that you find in the world. He doesn't. He's not an idiot. Paul doesn't think that there's no free will and human malice. He just thinks that sometimes, and I, I think I got this from either N.T. Wright or Tim Mackey, but he thinks that sometimes some aspects of human history cannot be merely reduced to simply people making bad decisions or being malicious. There has to be some kind of causal pattern. And Paul attributes that to what he calls the powers. Now, I'm not going to get into that right now. It's a a different topic. But what's interesting is we see here in the Roman context, this idea of might is right. And then you have this Jewish historical background with all these different religious expressions coming to meet in a character that Paul claims to have fulfilled everything that has been written down and that has been expected to happen by the Jews. So historically, we are dealing with something very, very interesting, and actually not just interesting, but fascinating. And this is what we're here for, to see on this podcast where all these ideas come from, where they lead, and what their effect is on the human conversation. And so I hope that's food for thought for you guys. I really, really enjoy reading Paul and reading about him by really knowledgeable scholars like N.T. Wright. But I'm going to conclude this episode on that note, and um, hopefully it's got you thinking uh, about history on a bigger scale. Even though we didn't even focus on that big of a scale here, we we simply looked at the first century imperial cult. We did bring in a little bit of the Jewish history too. and so. But focusing in sometimes and being cognizant of where the threads came from helps you understand the progression of the threads, you might say. So anyway, we'll leave it at that, and I'll have many more episodes coming your way, and I'm glad you could tune in, and we'll see you guys next week. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to leave us a review. If you want to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash thelogosproject, L-O-G-O-S project. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you guys next week.